Um, I think you'll. I think we'll have a lot more ground to speak about than than you might assume. So, hermeticism. So the the um, what's it called? The Kabbalion is based on like what they call the hermetic teachings, right? And then um, so the the hermetic teachings are um, basically based on a writer called Hermes Trismegistus, and Hermes Trismegistus is basically a myth. <laughs> like he's yeah. um, he's basically a myth. Um, but so, so, and he's the amalgam of Hermes, the Egyptian Thoth, the communication deity, Hermit, the Greek Hermes. And so that's thro associated with this throat chakra here, which is associated with the logos, the word communication, translation, articulation. And then also, um, yeah, so like, that's, that's like the birth of the her Hermetic tradition. And there's some really interesting history that I've been learning. I recently went to Florence and I'm learning which was the heart of the Renaissance and and the Renaissance of course was in many ways the foundation of modernity like a lot of our basically our entire worldview Western civilization, hmm? Western civilization like. sure yeah 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 and it has its roots in the Renaissance and something interesting about the Renaissance this is a classic kind of esoteric story but it's a very very interesting one is that um, Cosimo de Medici um, who is who is the like the elder of the Medici clan and 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 one of the most powerful and influential people during the Renaissance? He was on his deathbed, and his um, his scribe, his 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 um, affiliate um, called um, Marsilio Ficino, who was who was a a priest. He was um, there to translate works of the ancient world that were coming in from the east. I think it was the yeah, so monasteries out in the Middle East. Um, these texts were coming in, right? And they, and and um, Ficino was the first translator of the the works of Plato into Latin. So really significant time, right, in the development of of our world and, and Western civilization, as you say. And um, it's it's said basically that Cosmo, when the Hermetica came in, which was the the works of Hermes, when they came in. Um, Cosmo t basically told Marsilio to stop translating Plato on his deathbed and to start translating Hermes so he could read the Met Hermetica, which kind of speaks to the value placed on some of this wisdom. And um, it's really like a really fascinating perspective because when you look at the Renaissance as well, like what the paradigm shift was, as I understand it, was that basically the Christian or the Catholic kind of structure was kind of saying, if you want to get to God, if you want to get to the divine, it's like go through us or like go through the priest class or that we are the mediators for that. And the Renaissance was, a, was a real paradigm shift in the sense that it was, it was actually saying uh, man or like the human or the individual is the, the carrier of divinity. And that's a Gnostic idea. That's a Hermetic idea. That's that's a um, very, very different perspective, you know. And like, as you say, it's, it's really like at the roots of Western civilization, the roots, uh, where, do you, where do the ideas that we should all have free, the freedom to pursue liberty and happiness and freedom of speech and all of these things, where do these things come from? It comes from this seed that's, that came from the Hermetica which came from the ancient world um so yeah man like look al alchemy is just alchemy so it's a difficult thing to understand but on the same way and the same level it's not because it's it, it's it's rooted in the gnostic wisdom it's basically a way of perceiving a way of seeing things which says that the creative impulse the intuitive impulse the dreams the visions you have the, the play of the unconscious, the play of unconscious fantasy, that that unspoken like inward dream, that thing is the way to truth, it's the way to love, it's the way to wholeness, it's the way to, you know, like self-realization and all of those things. Um, yeah. yeah, man, and I think like that idea is a super powerful one, and it's really, really at the core of any program of personal development you know or any if you want to improve your life in any way that is the idea mm -hmm. <laughs> this at the heart of it is that is the affirmation of your dreams you know
Yeah, that's really awesome. Like you shared there, you know. Um, by the way, just one thing before we go forward, I think they can like sometimes hear a little bit of feedback. Um, oh, no. Is, but you have your headphones plugged in. It's, it's it actually sounds fine now. It's all right. Um, just, it might be uh, this thing, but yeah, but uh, yeah, it was just when you were talking. Like if I if I agreed or something, I could like hear that through the mic. But it's it's perfect. Oh no. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it's fine. It's fine for the most part. But um, yeah, like just what you said was really interesting. You know, like there was a lot to digest there. Uh, like I found this interesting. Uh, when you mentioned about, you know, like how these enlightened principles of Renaissance can be traced all the way back to ancient Egypt, you know, that was like a connection I never really focused on myself, you know, um, like I, I, I never really made that connection between the Renaissance and like ancient Egypt or, you know, the Kabbalion or Hermeticism. So that was very interesting. And, I, I was also thinking about the parallels with Gnosticism as you were talking about it, you know, like, um, because Gnosticism is like an area I've explored slightly more, you know, and I've seen that like with Gnosticism, um, like this ties in with the works of Dr. David Hawkins as well, who I know you're very familiar with, you know, like he talks about the calibration. So like, as you know, but just for like the viewers, like, David Hawkins, he works with a practice called kinesiology. And the basic idea there is that um, it runs off this idea that basically the entire universe is like a field of energy. So that no matter what point you look at, everything can be calibrated, any truth can be derived from that particular point, that person, place, or thing. And um, so it's like this, this, this quantum mechanics idea that everything is connected. You know? And so David Hawkins, he used this technique, which is called muscle testing, where it can be done by yourself, but it's more reliable if it's done with another person. And what he did was he gave a lot of talks with his wife and she would hold out her arm like that. He would um, ask a question. Sometimes he'd ask if he had permission to ask the question as kind of just a light thing. He did, then he'd press down on her arm after he asked the question. He'd tell her to resist first. And if arm stays strong that means that if the statement of the question calibrates is true and if her arm went weak and it was pushed down it meant that the statement was false and the idea there is that anything that's associated with truth makes you go strong whereas anything that lacks truth or is false makes one go weak so that's basically the idea how he was able to calibrate so many different things and one of the things he calibrated was the different religions and the actual branches within each religion. And um, what I found really interesting, because I'm I'm interested, especially in Christianity, you know, um, I is it were you raised Christian as well, Sam? I I was raised Catholic myself. Um, no, I mean like no, but like I went to church with my grandma and yes, kind of stuff yeah, like that. I think, I think I think I was like baptized and yeah. So sort of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 like. I'm not saying like I wasn't asking if you're just like very active. I was just asking like, what was your yeah your sure. religion? Was it like Protestant? Church, or uh, Church of England. Yeah, Protestant. Uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, because I was the same growing up. Like I wasn't uh, too too uh, devout or whatever. I just went to mass occasionally. But I think um, in like recent times, I've kind of come back to it a little bit more since like learning about Gnosticism. Sure. Kind of viewing it through that Gnostic lens, you know. Um, what's the difference for you then? Tell me what that means to you. So, what what's the Gnostic lens, and what's help what's helped you like come back to it? Yeah, um, like tying in with you know what you said and what I was saying as well. Like that's that's what I was saying. Like David Hawkins' works, he really differentiated between what I call Orthodox Christianity. And now I don't want to confuse that with Eastern Orthodox Christianity, you know, let's say the Christianity practice in Greece and Russia. Yeah. When I say Orthodox, I'm referring to mainstream. So just another word for mainstream Christianity. Okay. Uh, let's say the official teachings of the church, you know, so the Orthodox teachings, what's kind of the status quo. Um, so I would differentiate that with Gnosticism and more generally like mysticism or 
I suppose you could say like Western esotericism. Yeah. So the way I see it is like uh, there's a, there's a lot to say. Um, That's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I suppose like every religion, the way I see it, and I'm, I'm I I I'd say it's probably somewhat similar for you is that like each religion has like a mainstream orthodox body it's like the dogmatic yeah the dogmatic view and it's usually the most predominant but within each religion there's like a mystical core um that is much smaller and throughout history it's they've been very persecuted um and i'm sure you know that as well with the gnostics you know they went through a lot of persecution yeah, the cathars yeah yeah exactly um so like that's I think the mystics are more in touch with the teachings of whichever avatar it is. So like, let's say Jesus Christ, um, Buddha, Krishna, just the interesting side note, the Eastern religions for whatever reason seem to have maintained their mysticism far better than the Western religions, which Mm. throughout the years deteriorated and they became much more dogmatic. That's Um, interesting. Well, I suppose that might have something to do with, the development of the intellect um and like li- like literature you know like i think in the west that's very strong the develop you know starting with the greek philosophers with aristotle and that and that and then scholasticism um you know like the monks and you know that whole tradition of, of writing and in christianity there's there's the emphasis on christ being the word right like um yeah, so maybe that has something to do with it because, you know, I, I remember reading uh, Suzuki, who's a, a Zen teacher, and he gave a great par- like parable at the beginning of one of his books about just like this Western poem. Um, I think it's like Byron or someone, and he's talking about, you know, I walk par- I walk down the lane, I see a plant in the wall, and I, cr- like, I pluck it from the wall, and I say, can I know the secrets of God through this? thing right and he's saying that that's kind of the attitude of the west and then he contrasts that with basho who's like a, a zen poet and who, who has a very eloquent kind of like i'm in nature we are as one in nature and i just leave it and that's fine you know it's um and yeah kind of speaks to this attitude this kind yeah, of difference in attitude definitely that's like I, when I when you talk about the you know that thing about Boyer and picking up the flower and looking at it, I see that as like this kind of Victorian mentality as well of like you know dissecting nature. It's like very materialist reductionist, you know. And it seems like for whatever reason, the East didn't really succumb to that mentality as much, you know. Um, the East, or, right? Yeah, yeah. Or at least at least with their religions, you know, the religions just yep. maintained this very pure essence, and and that's something that. David Hawkins and his works, like, because I'm a big fan of him uh, right now, like, he, like I said, he differentiated the religions and he calibrated the Eastern religions as being much higher than the Abrahamic religions, you know, like, uh, he didn't talk so much about Judaism, but like with uh, Christianity and Islam, he talked about how they both fell from grace, you know, and with Christianity, especially, um, there was there was an event called the Council of Nicaea, which happened, I think, like 48 AD. I think it was like a meeting of like Roman officials and like different emerging clergy at the time as the church was just kind of getting established. And they, they, they reorganized the kind of official text of Christianity and included certain texts that were like we could say like less based in truth. And they, they kind of brought down the overall, uh, uh, I suppose, power of the, the works, you know. So Christianity had a kind of a fall from grace at that time. And that's that's really when, when I see the Orthodox Church that I was talking about, you know, the mainstream dogmatic view starting to establish itself. And I suppose the, the mystical or Gnostic view was, was starting to, you know, diverge and, and become, I suppose, more of a persecuted minority. Um, yeah, like I, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that as well. You know. Yeah, um, I just had a conversation about this. There's, there's a, there's a good book called, um, it's called The Master and His Emissary. I know I've mentioned that to you. It's Ian McGilchrist, and he's, it's amazing. 
he's really talking about the history of the world or the West through hemispheric specialization and saying how basically the left hemisphere which is supposed to be um, associated with linguistic processing with linearity with you know break, like breaking down that kind of byron-esque kind of it's also associated with gripping actually like when you get the point of so when you get someone's point you grab someone's point and he's talking about the hand mind relation and all of that which is amazing but he's saying um he's essentially like reading western history as the like predomination of the left over the right hemisphere and the thing that was lost so to speak is a shamanic way of understanding and the shamanic way of understanding is um uh, is, is basically what's called, it's like a, a, a participation mystique. And the idea behind that is that well, one exists in living relationship to the sacred images, mm. um, you know, and Jung called that numinosity. So he would say that the image of Christ or the image of the Buddha or whatever this sacred image, the sacred archetype is, does it have numinosity? Is it charged with meaning? Is it charged with energy? Is it alive? Is it lit? Is it speaking to you? And do you understand yourself in a living relationship to that? That's more of the shamanic understanding, I would say, because the shamans would go into visions. They would go into visions and into ecstasies um, and they would map sacred space, you know, like, and they that was the role of the shaman the shaman is the master of sacred space and i feel like that shamanic impulse is basically this core of mysticism you're talking about because you get it with sufi with you with with rumi and the sufi mysticism in islam um you get it with the gnostics as well in christianity you get it, the alchemists um are basically a compensation for well Jung thought of them as like an extension of Christian mysticism in many ways because they were bringing forth some of the things that were lost in church dogma and so Jung would think of it as a psychological compensation so the church dogma dominated say medieval Europe and therefore alchemy sprung up as this dream to say basically the dogma saying look redemption is transcendent the deity is transcendent outside of the cosmos and the alchemists are saying no let's look into matter because yeah. the matter maybe we'll find the imminence of the deity and maybe we'll find this is this is what's unexplored is the psyche matter you know the self like all of these things and that's that's really how alchemy can be understood i think historically um but yeah man like i think that's my that's my feeling and i think the feeling is that the shamanic participatory visionary kind of way of understanding is at the core of all true religions and that's what master leo Ficinio meant when he talked of the prisky theology which was the, the the prime theology the ancient theology which was thought to have come down to mankind from the gods directly and then that was the progenitor of all religious traditions those are some amazing points there um yeah just the last thing that you said it's freshest in my mind you know what uh that i can't remember the, the, what was the term you gave that it was like the core religion the Prisky theology yeah so what came to my mind there was aldous huxley had another phrase writing the same thing which is the perennial philosophy yeah That's exactly so you're bang on yeah, Huxley, so that idea comes from marsilio ficinio who in in the renaissance exactly yeah nice. Yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of how I, I saw it. It's interesting to get that other phrase as well. But yeah, like what you're saying, I felt was so bang on. Um, I really like the point you mentioned about, you know, how the dogmatic church is kind of looking for a transcendence, something above, something uh, out of this world, you know, whereas the, the mystics, the Gnostics are actually looking for us to go within, you know. And it's kind of like, it's that, it's that saying again, you know, as above, so below. So it's like, you can go up, you can transcend, you know, God is in this ethereal realm, but it's also within you as well, you know, and that's tying it back in beautifully with the, this Gnostic concept of the divine spark, you know, how like you have like the entire universe or the divine or God within you as well, you know, and it can be equally accessed there as it could be 
you know, through the beauty of the world or through these higher teachings, you know. Um, so that's amazing. And uh, I wanted to touch on as well this idea of like sacred space, you know, because that's something I've heard of. Like, I haven't read this book, but there's, I think there's a book by, uh, I know it's called his name, Mercia Iliade or something. Yes, there is, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to read that soon. Uh, have you read that actually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really one of my favorite books ever, actually. It's like, um, it's called The Sacred and the Profane. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's what I was thinking of, you know, it was like this distinction between sacred and profane and like how, uh, yeah, I really like that point as well, like how, you know, mysticism yeah. and the Gnostics, it's like rooted in shamanism, you know, and like how it's kind of pointing us towards this kind of other, this, I suppose you could say this greater reality, you know, um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's tying in with this sacred space as well. Like there's a sacred space beyond the profane. And in this society, you know, we're so uncultured with the profane space. And it's the same with the, the orthodox or the dogmatic view on religions. You know, often, like, maybe this is just my personal take on it, but I find that they almost point us more towards the profane, you know, that they, they have a very profane take on things. And that's why... I guess, especially as of the last few years, I've been drawn away from mainstream Christianity more towards this Gnostic side of it, you know, because I guess I've been yearning to connect with that sacred space and to do that through a Christian context, you know. So I think, I don't know if it would be possible, but I think it would be very, it would be a great thing for like, world if like somehow this this Gnostic knowledge could be brought back into mainstream Christianity or or vice versa with some of the other religions and kind of reinvigorate them you know because mm -hmm. like I feel like now people are becoming a bit more receptive to it as well you know because there is kind of this this grander shift in consciousness I feel and like mm -hmm. you know what like as we were discussing like at the time of the Qatars for example you know to hold a viewpoint like this was complete heresy, you know, you'd be literally burnt at the stake for it, you know, persecution. Yeah. So it yeah. had to be this very secretive hidden thing. Um but I feel like it's kind of it's kind of approaching a time, maybe I don't know, not maybe not in our lifetime, maybe it will, but like where this knowledge can kind of burst forth a bit more and be embraced. Mm -hmm by a, a wider audience, you know, and that would be Well, great. definitely. Yeah. I think you're looking at, like, the legalization of psychedelics in the US, the legalization of cannabis. I think, like, you know, I don't think it's necessarily just equate, like, gnosis with those plants, but, like, you know, I mean, I think there's a fair argument for that, actually, but, like, I think there's many ways to achieve gnosis, but I think that is a shift in attitude around that is very interesting. And also, man, like, the, the shift in attitude like when you look at it historically as you say like we couldn't this is heresy this conversation right but because we live in such a liberal society where the individual is really sacred like we we act out the idea that the individual is sacred right like that's what free speech is and you know that's really like novel po political concept definitely in, in history and um you know the internet's just scaling that out like i think we have we all have access to more information than the most informed anyone ever <laughs> like you know what i mean like um so i think that's interesting because i mean the way i see it is that if you think gnosis means knowledge you know and google is integrating knowledge at light speed like well it's integrating information you could say but like you know you've got You've got teachers on YouTube, you've got teachers and Instagram and Facebook and different ways of connecting to sources of knowledge if you seek it out. And so definitely it's a fertile ground, I feel, for some of this knowledge to prosper. And as, as I'm keen to emphasize, it is like at the root of modernity. It is at the root of Western civilization. Like looking at Da Vinci, uh, uh, Raphael, Botticelli, um, some of these figures, like their whole thing is an affirmation and a celebration really of the human spirit and that's the world we live in like that's what freedom means i feel like that's what 
I think the internet is just a platform. But look, what you're doing with your channel, what I'm doing with my channel, all it is is just two free individuals following their interest and sharing it. And yeah. and like the scale of that sharing is just ridiculous. Like you can reach people across the world in, in an instant, you know. And so in that sense, I think we're living in a Gnostic age. Like in in the, if you define Gnosis as knowledge, um, but that's one perspective but there's a kind of deeper more specific meaning of gnosis which is actually a, a transcendental vision or or a mystical vision or a direct seeing or a seeing with the third eye seeing with the eye of the mind um seeing beyond duality perceiving via the imagination intuiting you know dreaming um and in that sense i think that's just what art is you know like I think the degree to which our culture can embrace and celebrate and promote and explore art, um, the art, the arts forms have different art, arts, don't they? You know, um, yeah. I'm I like to read and speak. I think that's probably my art. But I, you know, music's a great art. You know, dance, like it's all. Art. And that's um, I'm going all over the place a little. But that's when you talked about sacred space. Some of the things I thought about were you know, music and dance, okay, like very primordial art forms. And, you know, dance is a transcendent and ecstatic experience. Um, and it's a shamanic experience, you know, because I don't even, even know if there is a because, it's just, it just, it's just of another plane of reality than space and time it's in this kind of eternal vibe the scene i think of is from the matrix if you know it when they're in inside i love that scene it's one of my favorite scenes you know it's uh mm. that's amazing that you brought that up actually i think i feel like um you know people who are on this path are kind of drawn to a lot of the same symbology and scenes like that you know and okay. like yeah. that because there's something there you know like even that scene is a great example like i mean I think the past like yeah like the past one or two years like i've i've listened to that song on and off there's like a song that goes with that and that like that imagery as well it's very like empowering or something you know it's i think yes it points to this is something i thought of when you were talking as well it was like it points to what terence mckenna calls the archaic revival yeah i'm sure so it's, it's like you know when you're talking about dance like that's a very primal thing as you said it's very primitive and there's something very like liberating and almost like metaphysical in that like you said you know it's like there's some things coming true um and you know there's this like idea of like the music like the music play the band or like the music move the crowd you know it's like this kind of higher intelligence comes true and acts through you it's like yeah. this very powerful thing um, you see that's an alchemy right so like i know i know alchemy can be a confusing word and i know for me studying it has been like this really esoteric thing but like that is a conjunctio of the above and the below right because <laughs> the below is the body it's the corpus in latin they call it corpus and the spiritus like the spiritus and the corpus are united in the anima which is the soul and like to me that's what uh, an ecstatic or a transcendent experience is and so whether you are inclined to study these things or not, you still believe these truths because the truth is the truth. Like you'll still go to yeah. a dance, you know, <laughs> you'll still yeah. sink your body in line with your spirit collectively. And I think like, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. I think I was just going to say like, I think, you know, people, they intuit this anyway, you know, and they take part in these, these rituals and they engage in some form of alchemy. I think it's just how you define it. And I think for people like you and me, you know, this is just our speciality, I guess, in a way that we, we love to kind of see the big picture and actually, like, dissect. Like, I, that's probably not my favourite word, but, like, dissect and kind of look at what is actually happening, you know, like, the mechanisms behind it. So, yeah, I think that's that's fascinating. And, like, another great example, like you said, is the, the legalisation of certain plant medicines, you know. I think that's that's part of, like, what... Our, our, what Terence McKenna calls the archaic revival as well. You know, like getting back in touch with these planned kingdoms because I think that in and of itself is like a whole world, you know, like for me personally, like I've done 
mushrooms that's kind of been my speciality but like you know you've ordered things like ayahuasca for example with like mm-hmm. dnt and like some of the stories that people like report back from that it's yes definitely that area of shamanism but also like you know coming into contact with let's say this higher intelligence like this guy in intelligence you know like the natural world like oh yeah 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 completely different light you know i think like that area is going to be huge as well because like the the, the majority of people on the planet like still like i i feel like pretty much all of us like we we don't even realize the extent of the intelligence of the natural world of gaia itself and like these plant medicines are going to be a huge way for us to like actually start coming into contact with that again you know and there's like there's even wilder stuff like you know the idea of like the machine elves that comes with dmt like these other dimensional entities like so there's a lot out there that we're not aware of yeah well yeah there's a saying in alchemy they say um he who makes manifest um the hidden he who makes the hidden manifest knoweth the whole work you know it's like that's literally it because like, what you're saying is like there's all these realms that are, that are hidden yeah like there's all these realms that are hidden and like kind of the role of the individual i feel or of the artist right i really like this kind of image of the artist because i think we're all artists we're all creative you know like where do you choose to live what you know what role do you choose to have like how do you choose to dress like like every act is a creative act and um I think that's a process of making the hidden manifest. It's like there's there's some kind of idea back here of like how things should be, and and look and like I think cathedrals for me like make this impression like really strongly upon me. It's yeah. like you know Saudi Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Uh, like what? Like it's just of a different order of reality. Um, and yeah, so that's sacred space. So that's like Eliade's sacred space is you can get you know, cathedrals. Um, but also the, like the microcosm is just like our room or like our, the center of our cosmos, right? And kind of, um, it's a very fascinating idea because it's a psychological idea and, it's, and it kind of defines space not materially. That's the really, really interesting thing about sacred space is that like, um, so okay this is just a fascinating concept to just explore is that Eliada defines the sacred as the place where the hierophany takes place and the hierophany is a specialized word it means hiero um, means sacred and hierophany means like the revelation of the sacred it's like the hieroglyphs are the sacred symbols the hierophany is the the rep with a place where the sacred was revealed right and we have this everywhere we have this the home of god is a cathedral we have this that old celtic mound where like the king was buried or like glastonbury with king arthur or like there's all these places where the hierophany is supposed to have taken place right and therefore those places are not merely the extended material places oh that's just glastonbury like no that is the birthplace of the legendary king arthur and then that's the whole arthurian mythos comes in you know and so yeah, yeah, yeah. um what this means i think this is a really like um oh, it's just just really transformative understanding for me to like really get around this is that it's like see it's like seeking hierophanies in your life like seeking the revelation of the sacred in your life i think you can't avoid a hierophany when you eat a psychedelic mushroom. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, that's, you're just heading straight for a revelation of the sacred by that. But also, I think meditation occurs that way. I think nature, you know. Um, And also another another kind of way that I've come to it is like um, the word, you know and like the, our ancestors and understanding like how they live in us like and how they live in our blood and our mind and our souls and how really that the words and the images and the spirits of our ancestors like they are the hierophany they're like the sacred ground upon which the kingdom is to be founded which is like aragorn in in the third lord of the rings who goes into the caverns of the mountain to to 
connect with his dead and forgotten ancestors of Gondor and say, look, I invoke you guys to come and redeem and restore and regenerate the kingdom of Gondor. I feel like we're all on a similar journey, you know, is that is to, we need to go into that cave that Aragorn goes into that's dark and terrifying. And they say, look, you know, like it's evil shit in here. But it's like, I feel like that's where we need to go because that is the, what the hidden you said, like that's all of that stuff's hidden. It's, it's implicit. It's like hidden in the world. And if we go there and find it and connect with it and revive it, that is, as you say, like an archaic revival. That's a, that's a shamanism, right? Because you go to the spirits and you bring the spirits back into the body or like into the spirit world and the world of earth are connected. Sorry about the fireworks. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much to say based on what you said. You know, like as you're talking, I'm getting like all different points going off in my mind. Um, but yeah, just first of all, I, I love the symbology of Lord of the Rings. It's probably my favorite film series or film or whatever you want to call it. Like it's uh, and the books as well. Like I just I feel like Tolkien, he really understood symbolism and, and allegory and mythology. In, in a way I haven't really seen with many others, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I just I just love the I think yeah, the Christian kind of it's kind of got a slight Christian element to it, you know, as well, like some of the symbolism and yeah, just what you mentioned there, like that was that was kind of a point I hadn't even considered, you know, like how you know, this idea of Aragorn going into the belly of the beast and like all dangers and fear and all that and reviving ancestors you know to kind of to help restore or reinvigorate the kingdom like you said it's amazing um and and he and he he's a very interesting narrative in that film right because he starts as strider so he he, he doesn't consider himself aragon yeah so like he's not using the words of like his true nature he's living He's basically resisting it. You know, um, Hawkins calls it letting go and resistance, like those basic principles. He's not surrendered to his true destiny, to his true destiny, basically, you know. He's more in the back of the pub, isn't he? Like, he's strider, he's got a cloak on, he's dark, and he's kind of in denial or in resistance to his true destiny. Mm. Um, and you watch his character, transform and evolve don't you through those films until he's finally until he's finally you know crowned um, i feel like uh, that as well like the whole strider versus aragorn thing like maybe like this is just me thinking but like maybe there's something there with like the young in archetypes about the king you know like maybe at the point of being strider like he's not really fully connected with that king archetype like it's part of it for aragorn going through the three films it's about like reintegrating this aspect of himself like the king and fully embodying that you know and maybe some of the other elements too um and then you see it like flourish at the end you know when he's crowned and the whole kingdom is like you know flourishing as a result you know because yeah i just want to like touch on the king eric like a little bit you know? like yeah i mean and he also that's that, that's completely accurate what you've said and he also marries he, he also achieves what the alchemists call the hierogamy. So the hierogamy is the sacred wedding. And he um, he marries an elf, doesn't she? He and and the elf um, becomes mortal, doesn't she? She yeah. she 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 um, so that is like a that is basically the essence of alchemy. Like the, the essence of the alchemical dream is the marriage, the conjunctio of the king and the queen, which you could think of as the marriage of the left and the right hemispheres. You could think of it as many things, right? the head and the heart, um, the Jung's, Jung's thinking type and feeling type, that's massive. Like, and so it can be a mystical inner microcosmic conjunctio. They're dramatized in narrative and symbolic form, right? It's, 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 a, it's an amazing like scene actually when you put it that way because there's so many different elements being united, you know, yeah. sure it's just one marriage. Um, I also feel like the, like having it between like a man as in human and, and an elf, again, it's like, it's, it's 
bringing together almost the profane and the mystical. And it's also, as you mentioned, it's like the left brain and the right brain, you know, so like yeah. um, the elf, the elven kingdom would be kind of more right brain, like in touch with the natural kingdom. Um, I think I have that order, right? So the right is like more mystical, more in touch with nature, language. The left is kind of more logical, mathematical. Um, so there's that. The other thing I wanted to say as well is like, something I always felt watching the Lord of the Rings, especially like the elves for me, they, on one level, they represent kind of mysticism. Like on another level, they represent for me, like the higher potential of humanity. You know? Like when I see the elves, yeah. they're kind of like the ideal uh, representation of humanity. You know, like the, the humans, like Aragorn, Kingdom of Gondor, they're like the more mundane or profane view of humanity. You know, well, there's the a, well, this you might find this really interesting is that there's a Gnostic there's a Gnostic idea basically, and they have three categories. You can read about this on Wikipedia, I feel. Um, so there are three categories of being basically. That it's actually it's all written about in this the Corpus Hermeticum, um, which is that that's the book that Marsilio Ficino translated. It's it's like basically the word of Hermes. It's amazing, but he but basically they have three different categories of being, and or, and they correspond quite interestingly to Tolkien's dwarfs. The dwarfs are the hillock. The hillock beings are basically thoroughly materialistic, can only see through the, the, the eyes of the body and the eyes of the, the soul are like shut. And so they yeah. can only see, they're just wedded to the material world, right? In the mines, food, beer, like that is materialism fundamentally. And then you get the elves, which are called the pneumatic, um, who are basically spiritual beings like they're eternal beings and they're as you say visions of perfection or visions of like the logos embodied or the quintet like as you say like just a paradigm of spiritual excellence and then you get the psychics and the psychics are man basically or humans and they are caught between these poles and i think that was um the renaissance vision was that um, and it's really, really fascinating. I think Rumi says something about how like good and evil were put in front of us to awaken our power of choice. Um, I really love that. But um, because, because I think that's really beautiful because it maps onto Lord of the Rings stuff. Because as you say, the men are partly profane, but they, but they're exactly that. They're this, this asymmetrical, paradoxical court between the realms of the dwarfs and the elves, which yeah. is what humans are like we are caught in one foot in the world of matter and one foot in the realm of spirit um, yeah, we have like elements of both don't we so we've like we, we do have access to that spiritual aspect but we're kind of balanced out by that uh that draw to the material as well you know um so that's really fascinating like i never I never knew the terminology of that breakdown, but I kind of intuited it, you know, just sure, watching course. the films, you know, just like see, seeing the, the dwarves as well. And like how in the Hobbit films, especially, you know, it's focused on them and it shows that they're drawn to like gold and, and, and treasures and all of this. So really fascinating. But like for me, just going back to the elves, um, I, I was always very inspired by them as well, you know, because I feel like one of my areas of, of focus and speciality from like ever since I started going down this kind of path of into spirituality and metaphysics and stuff, for me, it's always been like, at least in part, like what is the ideal for humanity and what can we actually achieve? What's possible, you know? And I've been very inspired by uh, the works of a guy called Charles Eisenstein, um, his book, The Ascent of Humanity, and also uh, the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. So Charles, like, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you've heard of him or read him, but like, I think you, you'd really enjoy his works as well. Um, but just, you know, in essence, like Ascent of Humanity, that would be his main book. And like, that's, it's, a, it's a, just a very comprehensive thesis of like, you know, human society, like how, our basic stories originated, you know, so like, who are we? Why are we here? What's the purpose of society? Where are we headed? What's the nature of reality, you know? And his 
the basic conclusion he came to was that um, however far back it originated, humanity developed like a story of separation. So like, you know, separate, like, you know, every, every area of society reflects this back to us. So, you know, science, you're uh, an animal programmed by your genes for, for reproduction, your own self-interest, you know, like finance, you're a rational actor. Well, that's, um, that's exactly in the Gilchrist's thesis, right? In The Master and His Emissary, it's the same idea. So like, that's bang on, man. And like, the, what, what connects biological thinking and financial thinking? Rational thinking, right? That's the deeper substrate and that's like left hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah, you're bang it's, on, man. Because it's all, it all ties together, you know? Like, that's, that's what I see as well. Like, all these different areas, they're kind of all pointing towards the same idea, you know? Um, so, like, well, yeah, like, yeah, like Charles Eisenstein, he was saying that that's the language he uses, you know, he calls it separation, that like, there is this separation, separation of yeah. all the different elements. And yeah, like I was saying, you know, all these areas, they reflect it back to us. So it's kind of re self reinforcing right now, at least in society. I think it's becoming less so, uh, especially like the last 10, 20 years, you know, we're talking about this this growing awareness, you know, you've got the legalization of plant medicines, you know, growth of Gnostic interpretation of things. So where that's leading to, according to Charles's works, is he he creates the contrast between separation and what he calls reunion. So he, that's the alchemical he, idea, right? So yeah. that they, they say dissolve and coagulate. That's the whole work mm. is break it down and rebuild, like die and then re reborn. Like that is um, the mystical work of alchemy. Yeah, yeah. So, so sorry, you, carry on. You can see, I was, I was just saying, it's almost, you can see that, what you said, society on like a huge like level, you know, it's like, that's like the journey that humanity has gone through, you know, it's like, because if you look at the ancient past, like there was a time, you know, when we were hunter gatherers or whatever, like we were living very communally, yeah. very connected with nature. So there was this time of like union, you know, and then we underwent this journey of separation. Um, only now it seems to kind of for that to start a reverse trend where we're going back towards union but it's like at a higher level having integrated many lessons along that's, this that's the second that's the second coming of christ like that, <laughs> that's that's my basic understanding of it man is like bang on what you said i totally agree because look separation you don't think without separation okay like so consciousness as we know it does not happen until you can break things down you know so you can say actually look light and dark these are different aspects of a spectrum in reality as we say like right hemisphere it's all one like it is all one like but you can say oh actually look that's blue that's green right that is the essence of our thinking and it's it's this left hemisphere here that's responsible for just breaking it down and it's just pros and cons, isn't it? You know, like as with any archetype, it's like there's ridiculous positive things to that because science is that. Like our, our mechanics, our physics, our, 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 our technical understanding is all rooted in separation. And so there's, there's a great virtue to that. But then, of course, there's, I think, a, a big I feel like where we're probably spiritually connected on this is that I know I should, I know I at least felt that I think that was the wound I suppose for me like in my education and my learning was I was just very left left hemisphere educated and dominant as is our legal system and education system because you know I read and read and read and break things down break things down break things down and uh, there just wasn't so much as you could say at reunion, you know, there wasn't much integration, much wholeness, stuff like that. And I feel like art, that's why I really like talking about art because I think art does transcend duality, you know, like I feel that's what music does. I think that's what painting does. Like, I think, I think nature does that. Like, cause art is a mirror of nature. Like it's all, all of that stuff. You can't really say that it's separate because it's all just, it's, the wholeness is abundantly apparent. Um, but I think something that's interesting is like, 
as you say, like the higher level, that's a really interesting idea because like if you reuni reunite at a higher level with a differentiated intellect, essentially, the potential for transformation is ridiculous. Like, and it's actually like consciousness becoming conscious of itself th through matter. Uh, and this is again the alchemical work. The alchemical work is is basically the thesis that we start in matter, we start in the corpus, we start in the body, we transcend the corpus into the spiritus. What, this is the, the realm of ideas, like you could say, understanding, abstract concepts, forms, wisdom, principles. Right. So you, you have to flee from the body because you say, look, the material world isn't giving me what I want. I must flee from that. And that's like the very stoic spirit, right? Of just like let me transcend the realm of good and evil, very Buddhist spirit. And then like you reunite that. Re so this is the dissolve. You like separate out the spirit from the matter. This is the separatio, and then you bring that down into the corpus again. But now you can fix it. You can multiply it. You can actually transform reality through the integration of the spirit which is basically with the integration of wisdom right it's like yeah. that's what it is is, is to, to, to to truly understand something as they say in uh the book you mentioned um the Kabbalion, they say you know that thing about knowledge they say the whole point is to use it right the whole point is to embody it and to incarnate it and to incorporate it and that's a fascinating thing so you have differentiated out the ideas in your mind in your spirit and then you can just bring that your, your mastery and technical capacity for influence in the material domain is much more enhanced and then if it's guided by wisdom and good and love of the truth and beauty and love then that's a very very profound <coughs> vision i feel um and yeah i think to me like if i intuit the idea of the second coming of christ that's kind of like how I can think of it is like, yeah, the teachings are revealed at the first level by like a teacher, and then they're like reintegrated at a higher level by like everyone. Like the kingdom of mm -hmm. God is like, yeah. yeah, that's I see it similarly as well. Like, uh, I mean, David Hawkins he talks about the second coming of Christ, you know, and what he says is that he says it's already occurred. Actually, like he even puts a date on it. He said like the late nineteen eighties that it occurred then so basically how he sees it is that so there's this calibration system you know zero to one thousand that i'm sure yeah you're familiar with yeah but just for the viewers it's like he that 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 kinesiology practice that i mentioned he has a scale from zero to one thousand that charts the different levels of consciousness and 200 is like the critical threshold between what he describes as falsehood and what he describes as truth so everything below 200 it's like it's limited, it's finite, it's kind of self-defeating, um, it's, it's negative, and everything above that, it's based on power rather than force, so it's coming from this infinite metaphysical... I would say the sacred, right? So it's yeah, like, it's I think they all, they all map onto each other, right? But yeah, because yeah. look, here's, here's an interpretation of Hawking stuff, I, I'd love to hear you finish, I just want to kind of add on it, is that it, the critical issue for him is courage and love, they're the two critical issues. So courage is a heroic value. And now you get into Jung stuff because all major films, all great films are hero stories. That's what Lord of the Rings is a hero narrative, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Which means the hero or the archetype of the hero is like kind of pressing into our collective imagination and gripping, uh, you know, like a whole nation or, or the world, right? So that's, so, so, so why am I saying that? Because for me, the hero has more, life and luminosity and energy as i was saying to like you know we all have our heroes right like we all have our local heroes the people we look up to our intellectual heroes are in sports or these different family or wherever like you know these models for emulation these imitate these paradigms and then we get them you know from the greek mythologies and our films and stuff right but um i'd like to hear you continue continue on the hawking stuff but like so for me that's all part of it is that the critical issue of courage is is an incarnation of the image of the hero right because it's saying i willingly go into the unknown i, I, I care i k 
care more about finding the truth in the unknown than I do about defending what I feel is the truth. That's pride, right? More, which is pride and courage are the core elements. So it's like I care more about going into the unknown and sacrificing my knowledge structures versus holding on to my knowledge structures. And holding on to your knowledge structures is tyranny. That's what tyranny is, you know? It's like. Definitely. It's like, uh, it's like facing the dragon, isn't it? Like that element of courage. It's like facing your fears, you know, facing the unknown, like you said, and like stepping out into that. That's like the critical threshold that like leads to, I guess, you know, willingness, acceptance, all of those qualities that kind of go up the scale then towards, you know, love, as you said, peace, these higher states. So, yeah, like just what I was saying was, uh, you know, what Hawkins mentioned about 1980s, like the second coming of Christ, he was saying that that point in time, the late 1980s, was when humanity's collective calibration made that critical juncture, you know. So, like, for the first time in history, I think ever, like humanity was collectively in a primarily positive, integral state, you know. So that he said that was the most important event in human history from one perspective. Because well, it was the Berlin Wall, wasn't it? I think is, oh yeah, the, the breakdown of the Soviet Union. Yeah, that def. I say that definitely coincided with it. Um, so he was saying like, from that point on, like salvation was possible, you know, because humanity was collectively in this positive state. And I found that really eye-opening for me because it helped to like break down this uh, this literal view on things. You know, I think that's a great example of like, you know, when most people think of the second coming of Christ, what do they think of? They think of Jesus himself reincarnating on the earth and meeting some kind of spiritual revolution or war, you know. And when in reality, at least how I see it and, and yourself and many mystics, it's like, it's this implicit thing, it's this, internal very it's the spirit important. of christ which is truth yeah. and love <laughs> being yeah. embodied <laughs> like how i That's see how it, I is, see it. Uh, yeah like you know what you mentioned um you know first the teacher appears so like in this case jesus christ and according to hawkins you know he calibrates like 1000 the highest that human can achieve in this in this physical realm so he kind of sets the attractor field or the attractor pattern or the imprint for that potentiality when he came down and he taught and he lived his life, whatever, even just giving out, even just being who he was, you know, like his essence, sure. and like it was so powerful that it stayed with humanity all throughout the centuries of like darkness, you know, of like the medieval ages of like the imposition of, of, of all horrible things. Like it was so powerful that that imprint, like you mentioned earlier in the call, you know, like this idea of, like archetypal images and giving out energy to people like is there energy behind them is there poets like he did that as an avatar and it's like at this point now we're as you said like kind of entering into this gnostic age where that knowledge or that essence is like becoming more accessible to everybody and it's you know it's part of the internet but it's just through the field itself as well of like the collective conscience or unconscious you know I totally agree, man. Like, I think that's, that's, that's dead accurate, you know? And I think, like, an interesting thing about it is that, well, you know, like, the political structure, as you said, like, the heresy thing is a really important thing because the, it's actually crazy when you think of history because it's, like, only a few hundred years ago. A few hundred years ago, that's, like, a few grandparents ago. You, we, yeah, like, you're right. Like, we like, would not have been able to say this stuff. But, um... But the Gnostic light's been kept because Newton was an alchemist, you know. Like, I like to keep saying that and reminding that everyone of that because he was an avatar in his own way, not in a Christ way, but he was the avatar for our physical understanding of the material universe. And he was pursuing this hermetic knowledge. He was reading the Hermetica. He wrote on, extensively on alchemy. And what's my point? My point is that the, the Gnostic knowledge has been kept alive, like, and I think predominantly through art and through, and as I say, through our culture, through like our very idea that individuals should be free and that they're sacred. Like that is, as Jordan Peterson emphasizes, not an obvious idea at all, like for aggressive apes, like that each individual is a carrier of divinity. 
not an obvious idea at all. I think the Christian tradition has been really important in that. Um, and I think the alchemical tradition as well. But um, what was my point? But, but, but my point is now, like the, the political structures, like the internet is like, I think that's got something to do with the eight as well, like computers and internet and information technology. But like, there's like the breakdown of the Soviet Union and there was that. And like, who knows what to make of it? But like my personal interpretation is like, if you're talking about historical empowerment of the individual, like we are ridiculously empowered. And, and it's not just like me and you, it's like everyone who has access to the internet, to be honest. Like you can learn how to make money. Like you can learn anything you want. And if you seek it, you know, so yeah, the yeah. education's there, available there. And, you know, we're lifting people out of poverty information is connecting all this amazing stuff's happening um so yeah man it is a this is a time of profound transformation of consciousness and um i think some of it is to do with like the political climate of like just a liberal climate like a liberal free-thinking society where people are able to think freely right they're going to look at the christian tradition and look at gnosticism and look at mysticism and look at islam and look at sufism and like you know get the picture that religion is actually uh, a mystery like religion is a mystery it's a living mystery for individuals and it's about the individual soul coming to know god and mm. that is the core of all religion and w we can't live without that man like yeah, yeah. a mental health crisis like for me like mental health and like a lot of like a lot of like the way a secular society approaches mental health the language is just not deep enough like you're, you're, you're missing god like that's, that's what it is like if you're ideologically possessed if you're depressed if you're nihilistic if you're alienated if you're feeling the dark night of the soul like any of that you know it's not serotonin it's not like these like secular kind of ways of dealing with it it's like no you're not your aim isn't right like your heart isn't in the right place you're not like, for, like pursuing virtue pursuing, pursuing gnosis pursuing contact with the divine and all of this is not an argument it's not an intellectual argument i'm not saying to anyone you know this and this is my proof for god i'm saying if you take psychedelic mushrooms you'll contact the divine like and if you don't believe me test the hypothesis i like and it's the same uh, that's why i think the psychedelic revolution or the changes in america is really interesting but also like dream work. Like I do a lot of dream work. I do a lot of active imagination. You can see this stuff here. Like um, I, I, I'm an avid pursuer of my dreams and, and, I, and I create music and I write diaries. And like all of these are ways where what we would call gnosis comes through, you know, where it's a way, it's, it's just faith. It's just certainty. You're like, okay, there is some other, there is some mystical other that is not I, it is not my ego, it is some other, Jung called it the self, you know, and he equated the self with the image of God, the living image of God, you know, and he, and he said there is some other, and that other is intelligent, and it will correct you if you're going off the wrong way, and it will affirm you, and stuff like that if you're going the right way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I see the self in that way as well. Like, you know, the way Carol Young describes it, you know, like self with a capital S as opposed to just sure. the self, you know. I kind of see it all as like, as, again, it's all one pointing back to the same entity or essence or idea, you know. It's like this higher power, this universe source, whatever you want to call it. And I feel like, you know, just bouncing off some of what you said there, you know, I guess from one perspective, you could say, like based on a lot of what we talked about it seems like everything from one perspective is like ordained you know everything is happening as it should there's kind of a process happening of this separation and reunion as we talked about but i do think within that one of the biggest problems with like western society or where it's gone astray as part of this separation process is losing touch with that higher power you know and again i think one of the problems here is like even language itself can be very divisive you know especially given the history of the church and the negative associations that have kind of 
built up around certain words. Like even if you take the word God, for example, like sure. a lot of people when they hear the word God, they instantly have a negative association in their mind, you know. And a lot of people are atheistic, or a lot of them are agnostic, you know. Like, and that's the realm of reason, you know. So if you're gonna go through David Hawkins' works, like the realm of 400, so like scientific endeavor, materialist reductionism, I feel like science has become almost our religion in Western society, you know. Like everybody's focused on this kind of skeptical reason like 400 level, you know? Like, um, it's, um, I totally see uh, why you're saying that, and I think it's, it's like true to an extent. I, I suppose, like, as co continuing on this kind of theme we've been developing, is that if truth, like, truth is truth, and rationality is not the highest truth. And I think for me, like, if I look at, like, Joe Rogan and a lot of, like, what he's doing, he's just critiquing, like, the whole, essence of what he's talking about is like psychedelic and shamanic essentially and um yeah. you know like and look, even quantum theory is tripping over itself like with the quantum ind indeterminacy like matter isn't anything it's it requires spirit um you know and so like you're totally right man but i think i if you look at like rupert sheldrake um listen to some of his conversations with McKenna or like Rupert Sheldrake and, and, and Joe Rogan and all of these things like for me and Jordan Peterson like for me a lot of it is like um it's just like good luck to science like trying to argue that it's like it's powerful it's right within a context yeah it's a limited like, perspective you know like it can only take us to a certain level and then it has to it's be useful as much right? true into love which is this mystical higher understanding of things and i think that's the distinction there's a guy called um m scott peck I'm, I'm actually not too familiar with him like apparently he wrote a book called the road less traveled but one thing i am familiar about with this guy is um he created like uh, four stages of spirituality he calls it so just very briefly, like the first stage is like chaotic, antisocial. So like these are people who have like an unharnessed will. Um, they're completely disconnected from this higher source, you know. The second stage then is like orderly institutional. So there's a really interesting parallel here with like the Orthodox Church and the mystics. So the Orthodox okay. dogmatic yeah. view on religion would be classed as stage two. So these are people who subsume their will to a higher institution they're finally looking for order in their life they move away from chaos to order now they have an institution like the church that gives them some meaning in their life but the issue with stage two or maybe not the issue but just the quality of it is they take everything word for word on face value so they interpret scripture literally they don't really have this connection to allegory and symbolism now stage three is skeptic or the scientific atheist, you know, so that's where I see a lot of society in the West is at right now. So, you know, everybody is very skeptical. They need to see the studies, they need to see the evidence, um, very materialist reductionist. And then there's the breakthrough into stage four, which is mystical communal. And you could say that's the leap from 400s, 500s, according to God. That's interesting. Yeah, it parallels the integral theory as well, doesn't it? Everything parallels, yeah. And, um, the mystics then it's about you know intuiting this higher power and in terms of religion and scripture looking at things allegorically and that's how i've you know tying it back in with the very beginning of the of the call or the talk that's kind of where my renewed interest in christianity is coming from because it's like interpreting it through a whole new lens of allegory and seeing that it's almost like the way scripture was designed is that it can be understood from these these two stages, stage two and stage four. So the literalists and the mystics. So there's just kind of there's maxims, there's rules that people in stage two can take away to give themselves some order and meaning. But in stage four, it's like you break through, you start to see the symbolism that the words are pointing to, and there's there's something else there, you know. And I think it's very powerful as well. Um, hundred percent, man. Yeah. Like, and that's so in alchemy, they that's called um they call that the white the whitening or the whiteness or the lunar dawn, or um they call it albedo in Latin, uh, which means whiteness. And um, what it means is the awakening of the imagination, 
and everything you talked about allegory like allegory is symbolic awareness you know and so that's a higher state of consciousness than rationality um because well because like even words are images you know <laughs> like so even if you want to start a logical concept like you have to it's rooted in image anyway um yeah. and so like you know when we were talking about aragon Aragon's the embodied implicit image that both of us have cultural access to and have had an affinity to have had emotional responses to all of that we might not have understood rationally until this call until we've actually put a word on the image and then that's even cooler because it's like music now we've got more of a symphony we're like aha I get it at the enacted and embodied level and I get it at the the principle and the aha like as my understanding integrates but um but what you're talking about I, I really like those stages they're really interesting and i think the mystical stage to, to be a mystic to think mystically the imagination must be open and i think it's interesting you mentioned the psychedelic thing as well man because like psilocybin mushrooms have been clinically shown to transform your trait openness you know your imagination potential they blow that wide open and yeah, like yeah you know, obviously, because you see like fractals and see like trees speaking to you and stuff. But um, yeah, like, um, so the, I think, I think what you're saying is right. I think science and rationality has, um, obviously, because it's been pretty successful, has kind of like, kind of usurped the throne as like, um, like the arbiter of truth or something like that. But um I suppose I'm 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 hopeful because uh, of what Hawkins says, and like truth is truth. Like, you, 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 like science has to be contextualized. Like, it's just, and it's just a weak argument. Like, if you just actually take in all all of the facts, and like as you said about the machine elves of DMT, that stuff is a fact. Like, if you want to be a scientist, you need to take the data into account. And like Rick Strassman's mapping of like the unit, the uni, unity of these kind of mystical experiences, um, and archetypal stuff, right? Like the sacred feminine, the sacred masculine, every tradition ever, like yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it implies that there's something real there, you know. And um, we need an understanding that uh, accounts for those anomalies and accounts for that data. And I think we're well on the way to it you know because um because all this information is coming up you know and we that's, need to argue that integrates it that's yes. that's how i see this whole transition that's just another beautiful way of like expressing it is like getting reconnected with i suppose you could call it the unseen or the, the unmanifest like these archetypal energies you know yeah. things like some of the experiences people are having with plant medicines like these, like you said, these areas are, how would you say, you can, you can attest that they're real through your own experience, you know, they're there to be experienced, and they're, these are the areas that, like, science and materialist reductionism can't really countenance, so they're the things that are going to have to be brought back into the fold, and... Because science lacks a subject, that's why, right? Because, yeah. like, to think scientifically, you can't be a subject. You can't be a, an observer you because it's aimed at the object so the very structure of the thinking denies participation and the validity of experience because yeah. you can't just say like oh look i think that hydrogen is this that's not how science works you don't just like go and like say that it's like you know i think hydrogen is this because i got it from a vision like just it's just that's not valid unfortunately in the scientific methodology um those, those are just the limitations i guess of the subject yeah. like you said you know it only takes us to a certain level um but yeah i'm really i'm really optimistic on the whole of like where things are going you know because it, like it's not that i haven't taken into consideration like all the wrongness of the world and society like i know things are really fucked up uh, in a lot of ways you know but I really do like have this unbridled optimism that like things are moving in the right direction and that like there is this shift in consciousness and that like personally I feel like like 
the human species is going to pull through in the nick of time, you know, that there's going to be this large scale awakening, you know, expressed as we have here, like with science taking on board these other areas or like those just becoming their own separate area of study and just people's minds opening up through plant medicines. Mm -hmm. I think like just in the next century alone, there's going to be huge scale change and it's going to be accelerated by the internet as well. Mm. So there's like a centerpiece to it all. You know? Totally, man. Final thought. Um, this person I was speaking with earlier, she's called Anne Barring, um, really, really brilliant woman. And she said, she mentioned an idea from integral theory, which I thought in one of her talks, um, which I thought was just amazing. And it's just the idea that, and uh, Hawkins says something similar, I think, is that the transformation, like the question is, you know, how is the world's consciousness, how is consciousness going to transform? Yeah. And um, she said, she made this point that in integral theory, they say like, you know, like only 1% of people need to, if you, the zero to 1000 and all of that stuff, like the shift only needs to be in the 1% of people like only a few people need to do it because as we say, everything's networked and we're talking about consciousness. And so what really encourages me is that conversations like this, man, like the present moment, right. Is everything like, this is really real. Like you've got a, a channel, I've got a channel and you know, small insignificant, you know, but it's this like, it's this 1% idea. It's like, all that's required is a shift in consciousness and everything's a network and these ideas are, are changing you know like look how popular like, joe rogan is and all he is is like some psychedelic pioneer who loves to talk about that stuff you know and so he's yeah. really opening up the, the cultural conversation he's got like seven million viewers or some subscribers and so like it's just fascinating it's fascinating time like really appreciate what you're doing man like like, yeah, like this. um yeah it's like it's awesome um so yeah like let's just keep, let's keep talking isn't it? I, I i just want to touch on that as well like i i think yeah it's a very exciting time to be alive um you know there's this like there's this joke on the internet of like oh born too late to explore the world born too soon to explore space but i think like now is like the perfect time to explore the inner world, to explore consciousness, you know, and to also just enjoy how that's expressing in society, just seeing the shift in consciousness, how seeing how that's starting to reflect. And I do think it is very exciting. And um, yeah, just touching off the YouTube channel, but I think like that's tying in with the internet again, you know, like it's just the power of the internet. Like anybody now can, it's that individualism, like you said, anybody can share their ideas, they can express. So that's, accelerating this process as well you know like everybody's in network you know you could say that like everything is connected to like in like a field sense anyway like i i truly believe that somebody just doing the work themselves and not sharing it with a soul in the world it would still have an impact of but course less i think as well just being able to express and connect with people on a physical level it's like very important and I'm sure it's the same for you. Like, I want to take the YouTube channel far. I want to actually grow a lot of subscribers. Yeah. To refine my message. And yeah, that's very exciting as well, you know. Nice, man. Look, I'll, um, I'll obviously put links and stuff to your channel and stuff on, on my channel. And we'll, um, we'll get, get this up. And what's this? A couple of hours of content. So let's just do this more, man. Like, really, really cool conversation. I think, like, we covered a lot of great stuff. I think, you know, that's, that's, we only touched the surface. There's definitely a lot more to cover, you know, so I'm, I'm definitely uh, open to do a few more of these in the future, you know. Yeah, nice, man. Connor, thanks, man. It's um, been really good to talk. Yeah, thanks, Sam. It was great. Cool, cool. Let's, um, let's wrap it there and, um, yeah, we'll catch up soon. Yeah, awesome, man. Uh, have a great week. I should keep in touch Facebook and everything, so. Nice, man. You too. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.